I heard the story about the family that gathered for Thanksgiving dinner and they said now everybody is going to express their special praise to God and uh, we're going to start with the oldest and go down to the youngest. And so they got started with this deal and finally they got down to the five-year-old kid. He's the last of the Mohicans. And so uh, he started by looking at this glorious, beautiful bird sitting in the center of the table. And he said, uh, I'm really grateful for that turkey because I know it's going to be good. Because I'm thankful for a mom that knows how to cook. And I'm thankful for a dad that knows how to go out and earn the money to buy the turkey. And then he really started in. He said, I am thankful for the farmer that grew this turkey. And I'm thankful for the other farmer that grew the feed that went into this turkey. And I'm thankful for the person that loaded this turkey on a truck and took it to a plant where they killed it and fixed it all up and then put it on another truck and took it to the grocery store. And I'm thankful for that grocery person that put it on the shelf. And I'm thankful for that checker that checked my mother out. <laughs> and he just kind of paused. And he, he, he looked around and he said, uh, did I leave anybody out? <laughs> and his eight-year-old brother by now, he's just irritated with this stupidity. And he said, yeah, you left God out. And absolutely without a flinch, the five-year-old said, I was just about to get around to him. <laughs> Somehow, that's how it seems to work out. We finally get around to talking about the Lord when it comes to the Thanksgiving situation. And I'm hoping and praying that you'll get around to him early on in your celebration this year. And that's why I've looked at Luke 17 this morning. Great story. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He's on his way to the cross. When these 10 lepers have banded together in their misery and they accost Jesus, they shout at him, Jesus, sir, master is the true translation of that word, sir. Have mercy on us. And Jesus did a simple little thing. He said, just go and show yourself to the priest and everything's going to be fine. And off they went. And as I look at this story, and I see the nine guys that never showed up, and I see that one fella that had the willingness to get back to Christ with an expression of genuine, authentic thanksgiving, I think we need to take a quick look. Number one, there are a few things that surprise Jesus in the scriptures. He watches people operate all, of, all the way through. He knows us, he made us, and he understands how we work. But I see him very interested here in the fact that he was kind of shocked and surprised when he said to the one that came back, didn't I heal 10? How come only one showed up? Anything that would shock and surprise the Son of God, that people would be lacking in expressed gratitude at a time when you would think because there was no other hope for them, they would certainly step up and offer their gratitude. I want us to think seriously about the gratitude level in our lives today. See, there's a couple of things we need to learn as we are in this passage. One of them is that Thanksgiving is not to be confused with other religious emotions. You can know a lot about religious things and have a lot of information, but getting into gratitude, that's another story. It's another story for a lot of people. A lot of folks miss it. We get irritated if folks forget to tell us thanks, but a lot of times we find ourselves living our lives without getting to the Lord who deserves incredible praise and incredible glory. I tell you, I've sat here three times this morning and listened to this choir sing that beautiful medley of praise to the Lord. It is overwhelming to be involved in that kind of praise to God. And it ought to be a part of our lives constantly to allow that to happen. But you see, these fellas 
These ten came and they expressed reverence. Oh, look in verse 12. What did they do? They stood a distance away. That's what the law said they were supposed to do. They stood a distance away just like the book of Leviticus said they ought to do. In fact, the rabbis kind of improved on this like they always did. The rabbis said not only stand at a distance, but stand downwind. They had the fear that maybe the breeze blowing past these lepers, some little spores would jump off and get on them. And uh, hey, they didn't know what caused it, what made it happen, and said you ought to get downwind so that you don't spread anything on us. They did the right thing. They called him Jesus. What's that name mean? We're getting into the Christmas season. It means Savior. You shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he shall save his people from their sins. But they backed it up by saying, Master. Incredible reverence. Incredible acknowledgement of who he was. And yet, when he completed the act of healing... There was only one out of ten that came to express his gratitude to the Lord. You see, we can feel reverence for God. We can do a lot of things right without ever moving into the sphere of gratitude that ought to be ours. You see, they came with urgency and they came with accuracy. They came to the right person. They came yelling and hollering, help us. They called him with the right names. They got all the right answers. And yet something went wrong after the deal was complete in their bodies. A lot of folks recognize who Jesus Christ is, but they fall short in the area of gratitude. There are a lot of, a lot of Christian people that have lots of information. I was reading about uh, Thomas Aquinas. Somebody read one of his books. He was the great... Middle Ages theologians, 700 pages they had studied, not one word about thankfulness. We had all this information about God, but no notion entered in those 700 pages that we needed to be tremendously thankful to this God. I, I, I want us to examine ourselves so that we do not fall short in the area of gratitude. Look in verse 14. He looked at them and put them to the test. He said, go to the Jewish priest and show him you're healed. Put him to the test. Hey, nothing had happened. Ten lepers showed up. Ten lepers cried out. Ten lepers turned around and headed up the road to go and find the priest. And as they were going, their leprosy disappeared. Their act of obedience toward the Lord. Now, now put this, get this straight, folks. This is so simple, we miss it. They obeyed. They responded to him. And yet, nine out of ten never said thank you. You would think the whole ten would have come back. But let, let's look at the one guy who did. This unlikely thanker. There's one guy that came back into the, the three things that he showed that the others didn't have any savvy. Number one, he showed some perception. When he came back there in verse 15, he came back to Jesus shouting. Now, sometimes in church, you're not blessed with that too much. But he came back shouting, glory to God, I'm healed. He had some understanding of exactly what God had done in his body. Only one out of ten. I don't know whether the percentages are better or not now, but I want to tell you this. Thanksgiving is not a matter of what has happened to you this year nearly as much as it is how you see what has happened to you. See, he saw something different than those other guys did. Instead of being filled with bitterness and thinking, look at all the years I wasted with this miserable disease. Look at me, I'm a Samaritan. I haven't had all the breaks these other nine guys had. He could come back and express thanks because he had a way of seeing what had happened. You know, God equips different animals with different equipment to see different things. You take a hawk, put him on top of the Empire State Building, and they tell us that that hawk can look down in the street. Have you ever been in New York and been up in that building? 
as I have. It's a long ways down to the street. They say a hawk can see a dime laying on the street from the top. Hmm. You think about a bee. A bee has a, the facets in his eyes. He's got about 15,000 facets in his eyes that enables him to see the sun as a single dot and to navigate by relating to where the sun is. I don't understand all that. I just know that's what they tell us about how a bee operates. He has a way of seeing that's unusual. They say the kingfisher has two ways to see. One of them, as he's flying over a body of water looking for some game underneath that water, he has wonderful vision to select that game. But if you've ever done any golf playing and hit a ball in the lake and take one of those fishing poles and try to fish it out, it all changes position out there when you're trying to fish that thing out of there. That kingfisher, he has a different way to see once he gets under that water. He doesn't lose that thing as is so easily done without his ability to see. You see, there are two kinds of seeing when it comes to thanksgiving. We can be nearsighted like the nine, or we can see like the one person who took time to perceive what God had done for him. See, it's all in how you see it. You think about a beautiful meadow, gorgeous crystal clear brook going through it, Mountains in the background, beautiful blue sky. Put an artist in there and put a cow in there. What's the artist see? He sees the beautiful green grass and the blue sky and the gray of the mountains and the crystal stream going through and put a cow in there. And what's that cow see? Hmm, dinner. That's all. Doesn't care how blue the sky is. Doesn't care about the crystal clear brook. Sees differently. And we have been equipped by God not only to see, but to express the proclamation that ought to come out of our mouth. The open thing, as surely as he came and said, glory to God, I am healed. We ought to be able to say with our mouth the kinds of blessings that we experience in our lives. It's amazing to me that the word of God is full of the kind of verses that tell us to give thanks and praise to God. And we're the kind of creatures that put us in a, in a right kind of a situation and we know how to express our thanks. If you had the good fortune to be parked in front of your TV yesterday afternoon, watching San Diego State and Fresno State, I'm gonna tell you how poor it is in my life. At the very last moments of that ball game, I was right here on this platform doing a wedding. Yeah, I've told Hillary there's gonna be some changes made in the, in the kind of scheduling that goes on. I mean, I am doing this wedding. And I had said to them, and they said, preacher, how short's this gonna be? I said, I'm gonna tell you one thing. These people need the Lord. These people that I married need the Lord. They're tremendous people, they just need the Lord. I said, you're gonna get the full ceremony. We're not cutting any corners for any ball game. But I'm gonna tell you something. I watched reruns later. I saw the sports reports on ESPN last night. And I found out that when Trent Dilfer threw that last pass, the place exploded. Why? Folks were pretty excited. See, it's one thing to go to a ball game and give thanks to God. And Trent Dilfer, I had the privilege to meet that young man a couple of weeks ago. He's a choice man of God. And I've been told by ever so many of you this morning that in that moment, he wisely said, I want to give thanks to my great leader. Everybody was holding their breath because they thought he was going to say Jim Sweeney. <laughs> and he said, the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, they didn't have time to shut off the mic, folks. He laid out the testimony in a moment of time when it would have been easy to have missed it. I just say to you, how do you perceive what's happened to you and how willing are you to proclaim the great delight of what has happened to you in your life? And then I ask you this final thing. Look what he did. The guy fell flat on the ground in front of Jesus. 
face downward in the dust, thanking him for what he had done. And this man was a despised Samaritan, recognizing the huge debt, prostration before the Lord. How long has it been since you found yourself prostrate before the Lord? Oh, we spent a lot of time praying while we're standing or sitting. Not much time while we're kneeling. And here this fellow, he's doing more than kneeling. He's laying flat on his face. Here's this, this, this thankful person, the most unlikely of the lot. Hey, he was a Samaritan. He could have said, look at me. Look at me, I'm a mixed blood person. I didn't have anything to do with it. That's just how it came out. Those Jews over there, those other nine guys, they've got all the breaks. They are the covenant people of God. They're the ones ought to be here. He could do a lot of things that he didn't do. He simply acknowledged with incredible gratitude, laying on his face before God, how grateful he was. Look what Jesus said. Oh, this is so key and it's missed so easily. Jesus said, didn't I heal 10 men? Where are the nine? Does only this foreigner return to give glory to God? And somebody says, Jesus shouldn't have said that. Why not? It was true. Only this foreigner, only this kind of outsider, he comes back and gives glory to God. And then he looked at that man and he said, stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. You see the difference? Ten got healed, one got well. Oh, there is a world of difference between the nine and the one, and the whole thing revolves around a man that understood something about coming and laying prostrate before the Lord and giving his thanks to God. I read this out of Christianity Today. Shall I thank God at this Thanksgiving? Why was I born at this particular time in the history of the world? Why was I born in a spotless delivery room in an American hospital instead of a steaming shelter in the dank jungle of the Amazon or a mud hut in Africa? Why did I have the privilege of going to school with capable instructors while millions around the world without a school book sit or squat on a dirt floor listening to a missionary. How does it happen that my children are tucked into warm beds at night with clean white sheets while millions of babies in the world will lie in cold rooms, many in their own filth and vomit? Why can I sit down to a warm meal whenever I want to and eat too much when millions will know all of their lives the gnawing pangs of hunger? Do I deserve to share in such wealth? Why me and not other millions? Why was I born in a land I didn't build in a prosperity that I did not create and enjoy a freedom that I did not establish? Why an American sitting comfortably in my own living room this Thanksgiving rather than an East Indian squatting in a dark corner of some infested alley in Calcutta shivering in the cold? Or a Cambodian in the rubble of what used to be my home or a terrified running Nicaraguan in the jungle? Do I deserve it? By what right do I have it? My encouragement is this, folks. Don't be a part of the thankless nines in the world. But be that one that knows how to express fully and completely your gratitude to God. And especially I focus on Thursday. I have three things for your assignment this week. One is to read Psalm 100 every day and especially there around that table on Thursday. Two, instead of doing what we do so easily to reach out and hold hands around that table as we pray, I invite you to take that entire group around that table and say we are going to kneel by our chairs as we pray. Get into a body language position of understanding how great God is and acknowledge that. And after you've had that prayer and you're sitting around that table eating that wonderful dinner, I want you to do one other thing. I want you to look at the person on your right and then I want you to tell that group one thing that that person should be very thankful for and then move that right on around the table. 
That'll stop a lot of foolish conversation. It'll start a lot of deep, sincere, great words as you look at somebody and talk about what they should be thankful for. See, and you may be saying, well, Buf, I've come out of a very difficult set of circumstances and I'm just not in a frame of mind to give thanks. I've lost a job. I've lost a loved one. I'm in a very difficult place right now. Let me tell you this one story as I conclude. One of the most terrible things that happened in the history of this world is a thing called the 30 Years War. From 1618 to 1648, all over Europe, this terrible thing took place and brought with it pestilence and disease in addition to the battles that were fought. The population was greatly reduced through this time. You read your history book. And in the midst of that kind of goings on, that kind of terrible time in human history, there was a very godly pastor by the name of Martin Rinkert. In a single year, Pastor Rinkert buried 5,000 parishioners. That's about 15 a day. That's enough to bring incredible pressure as you're dealing with these families and the depression that comes with disease and death. 5,000 funerals in one year, Pastor Rinkert officiated at. In 1636, this is right in the middle of the Thirty Years' War. In 1636, he came home one evening. He had written a table grace for his children. And he read it to them. And we share in it today because one of the great hymns in our hymn book is now thank we all our God and it's that table grace that Martin Rinkert wrote in 1636. It's number 564 in your hymn book and I want you to turn to it and we're gonna stand together and sing all three verses and think about the setting in which this was written. A man who had every reason to be depressed a man who had every reason to be obliterated by the pressures that were on him, but yet a man who came to teach his children, we will thank God through the circumstances. 564, turn to it, stand together, and we'll sing together.
Father, we give you praise this morning for the privilege of being your children. We've known the grace that has come through our Lord Jesus Christ. And my prayer is that we would know something about demonstrating that grace by the way that we live. That we would find ourselves into an attitude of gratitude that is expressed consistently, finding the good grace of God to shadow us every step of our way. Bless us, we pray. We'll be in situations, many, during these holidays where it's time to give a witness. May we do it with grace. May we do it with some understanding. But may we strongly acknowledge how important it is to give gratitude to God for his grace and his mercy. We give you thanks in the name of the living Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful hope to see you Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Bring your family and come and enjoy with us here. Thank you.